I, yeah, this is going to be a very... I got halfway through highlighting, so that's good. It was one of the first, mm -hmm. like, really classical pieces that I'd seen staged. And I'd seen it on Broadway, which was clearly a, a tour if it was doing that, but I, I haven't looked up what company it was that was doing that. Would have been in the late 90s. Yeah. But I'm excited to learn about it. Okay, you guys can all find the link to the YouTube on the chat or, or, or in the call, but also on uh, My Entertainment World's Facebook, My Theater Facebook, and the my, my, at My End World on Twitter. So you can share the link there, and we will do roll call in just one second. Okay. Somebody have a clock going in the background? Yes. It will happen every once Perfect. In a while. Actually, that's a perfect mood setting. So why is it going off at 7, 11 p.m.? Because it loses 10 minutes every single day. Oh, <laughs> that's so tragic. Oh. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let me. Okay, so if everybody is all set, we can do the roll call now. Um, you guys all know the drill. Mic, camera, say hello, all that jazz. Um, so our, oh, also um, French speaking people, if I pronounce anything wrong, let me know. Um, our organ is Sean Wilson. Hello. Our dummy is Elizabeth Yvette Ramirez. Hello. Cléant is Weldon Gorey, who is muted and maybe frozen. Oh, no. A very serious look on his face. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes. Hello. Uh, uh, Valère is Mark Crater. Oh gosh, um, sideburns. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> like mutton chops. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Uh, our Tartuffe is Christopher Prentice. Hello. Uh, Madame Monsieur Loyal and Officer is Elizabeth Morris. Hello. Madame Purnell, Marlo K. Shaw. Hello. Elmir, Shaylin Bass McFall. Hello. Doreen, Laura Hubbard. Hello. And Marianne, Melissa Wright. Hi. Okay. And we begin. Act one, scene one. Enter Madame Purnell, Flipot, Elmir, Marianne, Doreen, Dami, and Cleant. Come, come, Flipote. It's time I left this place. I can't keep up. You walk at such a pace. Don't trouble, child. No need to show me out. It's not your manners I'm concerned about. We merely pay you the respect we owe, but mother, why this hurry? Must you go? I must. This house appalls me. No one in it will pay attention for a single minute. Children, I take my leave much vexed in spirit. I offer good advice but you won't hear it. You all break in and chatter on and on. It's like a madhouse with a keeper gone. If? Girl, you talk too much, and I'm afraid you're far too saucy for a lady's maid. You push in everywhere and have your say. I... You, boy, grow more foolish every day. To think my grandson should be such a dunce. I've said it a hundred times, if I've said it once, that if you keep the course on which you've started, you'll leave your worthy father broken-hearted. I think. And you, his sister, seem so pure, so shy, so innocent, and so demure. But you know what they say about still waters. I pity parents with secretive daughters. Now, mother. And as for you, my child, let me add that your behavior is extremely bad. And a poor example for these children, too. Their dear dead mother did far better than you. You're much too free with money, and I'm distressed to see you so elaborately dressed. When it's one husband that one aims to please, one has no need of costly flipperies. Oh, madam, really? You are her brother, sir, and I respect and love you. Yet if I... Yet if I were my son, this lady's good and pious spouse, I wouldn't make you welcome in my house. You're full of worldly counsels, which I fear aren't suitable for decent folk to hear. 
Your man, Tartuffe, is full of holy speeches. And practices precisely what he preaches. He's a fine man and should be listened to. I will not hear him mocked by fools like you. Good God. Do you expect me to submit to the tyranny of that carping hypocrite? Must we forego all joys and satisfactions because that bigot censures all our actions? To hear him talk, and he talks all the time, there's nothing one can do that's not a crime. He rails at everything, your dear Tartuffe. Whatever he reproves deserves reproof. He's out to save your souls and all of you must love him as my son would have you do. Ah, no, grandmother. I could never take to such a rascal, even for my father's sake. That's how I feel and I shall not dissemble. His every action makes me seethe and tremble with helpless anger. I have no doubt that he and I will shortly have it out. Surely it's a shame and a disgrace to see this man usurp the master's place, to see this beggar who, when he first came, had not a shoe or a shoestring to his name, so far forget himself that he behaves as if the house were his and we his slaves. Well, mark my words, your souls would fare far better if you obeyed his precepts to the letter. You see him as a saint. I'm far less odd. In fact, I see right through him. He's a fraud. Nonsense. You all regard him with distaste and fear because he tells you what you're loath to hear, condemns your sins, points out your moral flaws, and humbly strives to further heaven's cause. If sin is all that bothers him, why is it he's so upset when folk drop in to visit? Is heaven so outraged by a social call that he must prophesy against us all? I'll tell you what I think. If you ask me, He's jealous of my mistress's company. Rubbish. Elmire, he's not a lone child in complaining of all your promiscuous entertaining. Why, the whole neighborhood's upset, I know, by all these carriages that come and go, with crowds of guests parading in and out, and noisy servants loitering about. In all of this, I'm sure there's nothing vicious. But why give people cause to be suspicious? They need no cause. They'll talk in any case, madam. This world would be a joyous place if, fearing what malicious tongues might say, we locked our doors and turned our friends away. One can't fight slander. It's a losing battle. Let us instead ignore their tittle-tattle. Let's strive to live by conscience clear decrees and let the gossips gossip as they please. If there is talk against us, I know the source. It's Daphne. And her little husband, of course, those who have greatest cause for guilt and shame are quickest to besmirch a neighbor's name. When there's a chance for libel, they never miss it. When something can be made to seem illicit, they're off at once to spread the joyous news, adding to fact what fantasies they choose. By talking up their neighbor's indiscretions, they seek to camouflage their own transgressions, hoping that others' innocent affairs will lend a hue of innocence to theirs or that their own guilt will come to seem part of a general shady color scheme. All that is quite irrelevant. I doubt that anyone's more virtuous and devout than dear Arante, and I'm informed that she condemns your mode of life quite vehemently. Oh yes, she's strict, devout, and has no taint of worldliness. In short, she seems a saint, but it was time which taught her that disguise. She's thus because she can't be otherwise. So long as her attractions could enthrall, she flounced and flirted and enjoyed it all, but now that they're no longer what they were, she quits a world which fast is quitting her, and wears a veil of virtue to conceal her bankruptcy, her bankrupt beauty, and her lost appeal. That sort of talk is what you'd like to hear. Therefore, you'd have us all keep still, my dear, while Madame rattles on the live long day. Nevertheless, I mean to have my say. I tell you that you're blessed to have Tartuffe dwelling as my son's guest beneath this roof that heaven has sent him to forestall its wrath by leading you once more. I heard that laugh, sir, and I saw that wink. Go find your silly friends and laugh some more. Enough. I'm going. Don't show me to the door. I leave this household much dismayed and vexed. I cannot say when I shall see you next. Wake up. Don't stand there gaping into space. 
I'll slap some sense into that stupid face. Move, move, you slut. Scene two, Cleant and Doreen. I think I'll stay behind. I want no further pieces of her mind. How that old lady... Oh, what wouldn't she say? If she could hear you speak of her that way, she'd thank you for the lady, but I'm sure she'd find the old a little premature. My, what a scene she made and what a din. And how this man Tartuffe has taken her in. Yes, but her son is even worse deceived. His folly must be seen to be believed. In the late troubles, he played an able part and served the government with wise and loyal heart. But he's quite lost his senses since he fell beneath Tartuffe's infatuating spell. He calls him brother and loves him as his life, preferring him to mother, child, or wife. In him and him alone he will confide. He's made him his confessor and his guide. He pets and pampers him with love more tender than any pretty mistress could engender. Gives him the place of honor when they dine. Delights to see him gorging like a swine. Stuffs him with dainties till his guts distend. When he belches, cries, God bless you, friend. Tartuffe, much pleased to find so easy a victim, has, in a hundred ways, beguiled and tricked him. Milked him of money and, with his permission, established here a sort of inquisition. Even Laurent, his lackey, dares to give us arrogant advice on how to live. He sermonizes us in thundering tones and confiscates our ribbons and colognes. Last week, he tore a kerchief into pieces because he found it pressed in a life of Jesus. He said it was a sin to juxtapose unholy vanities and holy prose. Scene three, Elmire, Marianne, Demi, Cleant, and Doreen. You did well not to follow. She stood at the door and said verbatim all she'd said before. I saw my husband coming. I think I'd best go upstairs now and take a little rest. Uh, I'll wait and greet him here, then I must go. I've really only time to say hello. Sound him about my sister's wedding, please. I think Tartuffe against it, and that he's been urging father to withdraw his blessing. As you well know, I'd find that most distressing. Unless my sister and Valère can marry, my hopes to wed his sister will miscarry, and I'm determined. He's coming. Scene four, Orgon, Cleant, and Doreen. Ah, brother, good day. Well, welcome back. I'm sorry I can't stay. How was the country? Blooming, I trust, and green? Excuse me, brother, just one moment. Doreen! To put my mind at rest, I always learn the household news the moment I return. Has all been well these two days I've been gone? How are the family? What's been going on? Your wife two days ago had a bad fever and a fierce headache which refused to leave her. Ah, and Tartuffe? Tartuffe? Why, he's round and red, busting with health and excellently fed. Poor fellow. That night, the mistress was unable, to, was unable to take a single bite at the dinner table. Her headache pains, she said, were simply hellish. Mm, and Tartuffe? He ate his meal with relish, and zealously devoured in her presence a leg of mutton and a brace of pheasants. Poor fellow. <laughs> well, the pains continued strong, and so she tossed and tossed the whole night long. Now icy cold, now burning like a flame, we sat beside her bed till morning came. Ah, and Tartuffe. Why, having eaten, he rose and sought his room, already in a doze, got into his warm bed and snored away in perfect peace until the break of day. Poor fellow. <laughs> After much ado, we talked her into dispatching someone for the doctor. He blooded her and the fever quickly fell. Ah, and Tartuffe. He bore it very well, to keep his cheerfulness at any cost, and... Make up for the blood Madam had lost, he drank at lunch four beakers full of port. Oh, poor fellow! Both are doing well in short. I'll go and tell Madam that you've expressed keen sympathy and anxious interest. Scene hmm. five, or gone, Cleant. That girl was laughing in your face. And though I've no wish to offend you, even so I'm bound to say that she had some excuse. How can you possibly be such a goose? Are you so dazed by this man's hocus-pocus that all the world save him is out of focus? 
You've given him clothing, shelter, food, and care. Why must you also... Brother, stop right there. You do not know the man of whom you speak. I grant you that. But my judgment's not so weak that I can't tell by his effect on others. (laughs) When you meet him, you two will be like brothers. There's been no loftier soul since time began. He's a man who... A man who... An excellent man. To keep his precepts is to be reborn and view this dunghill of a world with scorn. Yes, thanks to him, I am a changed man indeed. Under his tutelage, my soul's been freed. From earthly loves and every human tie, my mother, children, brother, and wife could die, and I'd not feel a single moment's pain. That's a fine sentiment, brother. Most humane. Oh, had you seen Tartuffe as I first knew him, your heart, like mine, would have surrendered to him. He used to come into our church each day and humbly kneel nearby and start to pray. He'd draw the eyes of everybody there by the deep fervor of his heartfelt prayer. He'd sigh and weep. And sometimes, with a sound of rapture, he would bend and kiss the ground his serving man, no less devout than he, informed me of his master's poverty. I gave him gifts, but in his humbleness, he begged me every time to give him less. Oh, that's too much, he'd cry. Too much by twice. I don't deserve it. The half, sir, would suffice. And when I wouldn't take it back, he'd share half of it with the poor right then and there. At length, heaven prompted me to take him in to dwell with us and free our souls from sin. He guides our lives and to protect my honor stays by my wife and keeps an eye upon her. He tells me whom she sees and all she does and seems more jealous than I ever was. Good God, man. Have you lost your common sense, or is this all some joke at my expense? How can you stand there and in all sobriety? Brother, your language savors of impiety. Too much free thinking's made your faith unsteady, as I, and as I've warned you many times already, it will get you into trouble before you're through. So I've been told before by dupes like you. Being blind, you'd have all others blind as well. The clear-eyed man you call an infidel, and he who char- sees through humbug and pretense is charged by you with want of reverence. Spare me your warnings, brother. I have no fear of speaking out for you in heaven to hear against affected zeal and pious knavery. There's true and false in piety, as in bravery. And just as those whose courage shines the most in battle are the least inclined to boast, so those whose hearts are truly pure and lowly, don't make a flashy show of being holy. There's a vast difference, so it seems to me, between true piety and hypocrisy. Ah, brother, man's a strangely fashioned creature who seldom is content to follow nature, but recklessly pursues his inclination beyond the narrow bounds of moderation and often, by transgressing reason's laws, perverts a lofty aim or noble cause. Passing observation, but it applies. I see, dear brother, that you're profoundly wise. You harbor all the insight of the age. You are our one clear mind, our only sage. Brother, I don't pretend to be a sage, nor have I all the wisdom of the age. There's just one insight I would dare to claim. I know that true and false are not the same. And just as there is nothing I more revere than a soul whose faith is steadfast and sincere, nothing that I more cherish and admire than honest zeal and true religious fire, so there is nothing that I find more base than specious piety's dishonest face. Now then, dear brother, is your speech concluded? Oh, why, yes. Your servant, sir. No, brother, wait. There's one more matter. You agreed of late that young Valer might have your daughter's hand. I did. And set the dates, I understand. Quite so. You've now postponed it, is that true? No doubt. The match no longer pleases you? Who knows? Do you mean to go back on your word? I won't say that. 
Has anything occurred which might entitle you to break your pledge? Perhaps. Why must you hem and haw and hedge? The boy asked me to sound you in this affair. It's been a pleasure. What shall I tell Valère? Whatever you like. But what have you decided? What are your plans? I plan, sir, to be guided by heaven's will. Oh, come, brother, don't talk rot. You've, gi you've given Valère your word. Will you keep it or not? Good day. Uh, this looks like poor Valère's undoing. I'll go and warn him that there's trouble brewing. Act two, scene one, Orgon and Marianne. Marianne? Yes, father? A word with you. Come here. What are you looking for? Uh, eavesdroppers, dear. I'm making sure we shan't be overheard. Someone in there could catch our every word. Ah, good, we're safe. Now, Marianne, my child, you're a sweet girl who's tractable and mild, whom I hold dear and think most highly of. I'm deeply grateful, Father, for your love. That's well said, daughter. And you can repay me if, in all things, you'll cheerfully obey me. Uh, to please you, sir, is what delights me best. Good, good. Now, what do you think of Tartuffe, our guest? I, sir? Yes. Weigh your answer. Think it through. Oh, dear. I'll say whatever you wish me to. Mm, that's wisely said, my daughter. Say of him, then, that he's the very worthiest of men and that you're fond of him, and would rejoice in being his wife, if that should be my choice. Well? What? What's that? I... Well? For forgive me, pray. Did you not hear me? Uh, of whom, sir, must I say that I am fond of him, and would rejoice in being his wife, if that should be your choice? Why? Of Tartuffe. But, Father, that's false, you know. Why would you have me say what isn't so? Because I am resolved it shall be true. That it's my wish should be enough for you. You can't mean, Father. Yes, Tartuffe shall be allied by marriage to this family. And he's to be your husband. Is that clear? It's a father's privilege. Being what are you... Doreen or gone, Marianne. What are you doing in here? Is curiosity so fierce a passion with you that you must eavesdrop in this fashion? There's lately been a rumor going about based on some hunch or chance remark, no doubt, that you mean Marianne to wed Tartuffe? I've laughed it off, of course, it, it, as just a spoof. You find it so incredible? Yes, I do. I won't accept that story, even from you. Well, you'll believe it when the thing is done. Yes. Yes, of course. Go on and have your fun. I've never been more serious in my life. <laughs> Daughter, I mean it. You're to be his wife. No, don't believe your father. It's all a hoax. See here, young woman. Come, sir, no more jokes. You can't fool us. How dare you talk that way? All right, then. We believe you, sad to say, but how a man like you, who looks so wise and wears a mustache of such splendid size, can be so foolish as... Silence, please! My girl, you take too many liberties. I'm master here, as you must not forget. Do let's discuss this calmly. Don't be upset. You can't be serious, sir, about this plan. What should that bigot want with Marianne? Praying and fasting ought to keep him busy, and then in terms of wealth and rank, what is he? Why should a man of property like you pick out a beggar son-in-law? That will do. Speak of his poverty with reverence. He is a pure and saintly indigence, which far transcends all worldly pride and pelf. He lost his fortune, as he says himself, because he cared for heaven alone, and so was careless of his interests here below. 
I mean to get him out of his present straits and help him to recover his estates, which in, in his part of the world will have no small fame. Poor though he is, he's a gentleman, just the same. Yes, so he tells us. And, sir, it seems to me such pride goes very ill with piety. But this approach, I see, has drawn a blank. Let's speak, then, of this person, not his rank. Doesn't it seem to you a trifle grim to give a girl like her to a man like him? When two are so ill-suited, can't you see what the sad consequence is bound to be? A young girl's virtue is imperiled. Sir, when such a marriage is imposed on her, for if one's bridegroom isn't to one's taste, it's hardly an inducement to be chaste, and many a man with horns upon his brow has made a wife the thing that she is now. It's hard to be faithful wife, in short, to certain husbands of a certain sort. A father who must give his daughter to a man she hates must answer for her sins at heaven's gates. Think, sir, before you play so risky a role. <laughs> this servant girl presumes to save my soul. You would do well to ponder what I've said. Daughter, will disregard this dunderhead. Just trust your father's judgment. Oh, I'm aware that I once promised you to young Valer, but now I hear he gambles, which greatly shocks me. <laughs> What's more, I've doubts about his orthodoxy. He vis his visits to church, I note, are very few. Would you have him go at the same hours as you and kneel nearby to be sure of being seen? I can dispense with such remarks, Doreen. Tartuffe, however, is sure of heaven's blessing, and that's the only treasure worth possessing. And she'll make a, cum a cuckold. Just wait and see. What language? Oh, he's a man of destiny. He's made for horns, and what the stars demand your daughter's virtue surely can't withstand. Don't interrupt me further. Why can't you learn that certain things are none of your concern? It's for your own sake that I interfere. Most kind of you. Now, hold your tongue, do you hear? If I didn't love you... Spare me your affection. I'll love you, sir, in spite of your objection. Blast! I can't bear, sir, for your honor's sake to let you make this ludicrous mistake. You mean to go on talking? If I didn't protest this sinful marriage, my conscience couldn't rest. If you don't hold your tongue, you little shrew. What? Lost your temper? A pious man like you? Yes! Yes, you talk and talk! I'm maddened by it! Once and for all, I tell you to be quiet. Well, I'll be quiet, but I'll be thinking hard. Think all you like, but you had better guard that saucy tongue of yours or I'll... Now, child, I've weighed this matter fully. It drives me wild that I can't speak. Tartuffe is no young dandy, but still his person... Is as sweet as candy. If is such that even if you shouldn't care for his other merits... They'll make a lovely pair. If I were she, no man would marry me against my inclination and go scot-free. He'd learn before the wedding day was over how readily a wife can find a lover. It seems you treat my orders as a joke. Why? What's the matter? It was not to you I spoke. What were you doing? Talking to myself. That's ah! All. One more bit of impudence and gall, and I shall give her a good slap in the face. He puts himself in position to slap her. Doreen, whenever he glances at her, stands immobile and silent. Daughter, you shall accept with good grace the husband I've selected. Your wedding day. Why don't you talk to yourself? I've nothing to say. Oh, come. Just one word. No, thank you, sir. I pass. Come. Speak. I'm waiting. I'd not be such an ass. In short, dear daughter, I mean to be obeyed, and you must 
bow to the sound choice I've made. I'd not wed such a monster even in jest. Persona attempts to slap her, but misses. Daughter, that maid of yours is a thorough pest. She makes me sinfully annoyed and nettled. I can't speak further. My nerves are too unsettled. She so upset me by her insolent talk. I'll calm myself by going for a walk. Scene three, Doreen and Marianne. Doreen returns. Well, have you lost your tongue, girl? Must I play your part and say the lines you ought to say, faced with a fate so hideous and absurd? Can you not utter one dissenting word? What good would it do? A father's power is great. Resist him now, or it will be too late. But... Tell him one cannot love at a father's whim that you shall marry for yourself and not for him. That since it's you who are to be the bride, it's you, not he, who must be satisfied. And that if his tartuffe is so sublime, he's free to marry him at any time. I've bowed so long to father's strict control, I can't oppose him now to save my soul. Come, come, Marianne, do listen to reason, won't you? Valère has asked your hand. Do you love him or don't you? Oh, how unjust of you. What can you mean by asking such a question, dear Doreen? You know the depth of my affection for him. I've told you a hundred times how I adore him. I don't believe in everything I hear. Who knows if your professions were sincere? They were, Doreen, and you do me wrong to doubt it. Heaven knows that I've been all too frank about it. You love him then? No more than I can express. And he, I take it, cares for you no law? I think so. And you both, with equal, equal fire, burn to be married? That is our desire. What tartuffe then? What of your father's plan? I'll kill myself if I'm forced to wed that man. I hadn't thought of that recourse. How splendid. Just die and all your troubles will be ended. A fine solution. Oh, it maddens me to hear you talk in that self-pitying key. Doreen, how harsh you are. It's most unfair. You have no sympathy for my despair. I've not at all for people who talk drivel and, when faced with difficulties, whine and snivel. No doubt I'm timid, but it would be wrong. True love requires a heart that's firm and strong. I'm strong in my affection for Valère, but coping with my father is his affair. But if your father's brain has grown so cracked over his dear Tartuffe that he can retract his blessing though your wedding day was named, it surely is not Valère who's to be blamed. If I defied my father, as you suggest, would it not seem unmaidenly at best? Shall I defend my love at the expense of brazenness and disobedience? Shall I parade my heart's desires and flaunt? No, I ask nothing of you. Clearly, you want to be Mrs. Tartuffe. And I feel bound not to be opposed to a wish so very sound what right have I to criticize the match. Indeed, my dear, the man's a brilliant catch. Mr. Tartuffe, now, there's a man of weight. Yes, yes, Mr. Tartuffe. I'm bound to state is quite a person. That's not to be denied. T'will be no little thing to be his bride. The world already rings with his renown. He's a great noble in his native town. His ears are red. He has a pink complexion. And all in all, he'll suit you to perfection. Your God. Oh, how triumphant you will feel at having caught a husband so ideal. Oh, do stop teasing and use your cleverness to get me out of this appalling mess. Advise me and I'll do whatever you say. Ah, no, a dutiful, a dutiful daughter must obey her father, even if he weds her to an ape. You've a bright future. Why struggle to escape your husband? Oh, you turn my blood to ice. Stop torturing me and give me your advice. Your servant, madam. Doreen, I beg of you. No, you deserve it. This marriage must go through. Doreen? No. Not Tartuffe. You know I think him... Tartuffe's your cup of tea and you shall drink him. I've always told you everything and relied. No, you deserve to be tartutified. Well, since you mock me and refuse to care, I'll henceforth seek my solace in despair. 
Despair shall be my counselor and friend and help me bring my sorrows to an end. He starts to leave. There now, come back. My anger has subsided. You do deserve some pity, I've decided. Doreen, if father makes me undergo this dreadful martyrdom, I'll die, I know. Don't fret. It won't be difficult to discover some plan of action, but here's Valère, your lover. Madame, I've just received some wondrous news regarding which I'd like to hear your views. What news? You're marrying Tartuffe. I find that father does have such a match in mind. Your father, madam. Has just this minute said that it's Tartuffe he wishes me to wed. Oh, can he be serious? Oh, indeed he can. He's clearly set his heart upon the plan. And what position do you propose to take, madam? Why, I, I don't know. For heaven's sake, you, you don't know? No. Well... Well. Advise me, do. Marry the man. That's my advice to you. That's your advice? Yes. What? Truly? Oh, absolutely. You couldn't choose more wisely, more astutely. Thanks for the counsel. I'll follow it, of course. Do, do. I'm sure it will cost you no remorse. To give it didn't cause your heart to break. I gave it, madam, only for your sake. And it's for your sake that I take it, sir. Let's see which fool will... Prove the stubborner. So, I am nothing to you? And it was flat deception when you- Please, enough of that. You've told me plainly that I should agree to wed the man my father has chosen for me. And since you've deigned to counsel me so wisely, I promise, sir, to do as you advise me. Ah, uh, no, it was not by me that you were swayed. No, your decision was already made. Though now, to save appearances, you protest that you're betraying me at my behest. Just as you say. Quite so. And I now see that you were never truly in love with me. Alas, you're free to think so, if so, if you choose. I choose to think so, and here's a bit of news. You've spurned my hand, but I know where to turn for kinder treatment, as you shall quickly learn. I'm sure you do. Your noble qualities inspire affection. Forget my qualities, please. They don't inspire you over much, I find. But there's another lady I have in mind, whose sweet and generous nature will not scorn to compensate me for the loss I've borne. I'm no great loss, and I'm sure that you'll transfer your heart quite painlessly from me to her. I'll do my best to take it in my stride. The pain I feel at being cast aside time and forgetfulness may put an end to, or if I can forget, I shall pretend to. No self-respecting person is expected to go on loving once he's been rejected. Now that's a fine, high-minded statement. One to which any sane man would assent. Would you prefer it if I pined away in hopeless passion till my dying day? Go then. Console yourself. Don't hesitate. I wish you to. Indeed, I cannot wait. You wish me to? Yes. That's the final straw. Madam, farewell. Your wish shall be my law. He starts to leave and then returns repeatedly. Splendid. This breach, remember, is of your making. It's you who've driven me to step to the step I'm taking. Of course. Remember, too, that I am merely following your example. I see that clearly. Enough. I'll go and do your bidding then. Good. You shall never see my face again. Excellent. Yes? What? What's that? What did you say? Nothing. You're dreaming. Yeah, well, I'm on my way. He moves away slowly. <laughs> Farewell. If you ask me, both of you are as mad as mad can be. Do stop this nonsense now. I'll only let you squabble so long to see where it would get you. Whoa there, dearest Valère. She goes and seizes Valère by the arm. He makes a great show of resistance. What's this, Doreen? Come here. No, no. My heart's too full of spleen. Don't hold me back. Stop. Made. It's Stop. too late now. My decision's made. Oh, poo. <sighs> he hates the sight of me. That's plain. I'll go and so deliver him from pain. Doreen leaves Valère running after Mariana. And now you run away. Come back. No, no, nothing you say will keep me here. Let go. 
she cannot bear my presence. I perceive to spare her further torment, I shall leave. Tareen leaves Marianne, runs after Valère. Again, again, you'll not escape. Sir, don't, don't. You try it. Come here. You two stop fussing and be quiet. She takes Valère by the by end, then Marianne, and draws them together. What do you want of me? What is the point of this? We're going to have a little armistice. Now, weren't you silly to get overheated? Didn't you see how badly I was treated? And aren't you a simpleton to have lost your head? Didn't you hear the hateful things he said? You're both great fools. Her sole desire, Belair, is to be yours in marriage to that elsewhere. He loves you only, and he wants no wife but you, Marianne. Oh, on that I'll stake my life. Then why you advise me so I cannot see? On such a question, why ask advice of me? Oh, you're impossible. Give me your hands, you two. Yours first. But why? And now a hand from you. What are you doing? Aw, there. A perfect fit. You'll suit each other better than you'll admit. Valer and Marianne hold hands for some time without looking at each other. <laughs> oh, come, don't be so haughty. Give a man a look of kindness, won't you, Marianne? Marianne turns towards Valer and smiles. I tell you, lovers are completely mad. Now, come, confess that you were very bad to hurt my feelings as you did just now. I have a just complaint you must allow. You must allow that you were most unpleasant. Oh, shot, man. Uh, let's table that discussion for the present. Your father has a plan which must be stopped. Advise us then, what means must we adopt? We'll use all manner of means and all at once. Your father's addled. He's acting like a dunce. Therefore, you'd better, hu you'd better humor the old fossil. Pretend to yield to him, be sweet and docile, and then postpone as often as necessary. The day on which you have agreed to marry, you'll thus gain time, and time will turn the trick. Sometimes, for instance, you'll be taken sick. And that will seem good reason for delay, or some bad omen will make you change the day. You'll dream of muddy water, or you'll pass a dead man's hearse, or break a looking glass. And if all else fails, no man can marry you unless you take his ring and say, I do. But now, let's separate, and if they should find us talking here, our plot might be divined. Go to your friends and tell them what's occurred and have them urge her father to keep his word. Meanwhile, we'll stir her brother into action and get Elmir as well to join our faction. Goodbye. Though each of us will do his best, it's your true heart on which my hopes shall rest. Regardless of what my father may decide, none but Valer shall claim me as his bride. Oh, how these words content me. Come, what will? Oh, lovers, lovers, their tongues are never still. Be off now. One last word. And turns no, no, no time to chat. <laughs> leave by the door, and you leave by that. Doreen pushes them towards opposing doors. Act three, scene one, Demi and Doreen. May lightning strike me, even as I speak. May all men call me cowardly and weak, if any fear or scruple holds me back from settling things at once with that great quack. Now, don't give way to violent emotion. Your father's merely talked about the notion in words and deeds are far from being one. Much that is talked about is left undone. No, I must stop that scoundrel's machinations. I'll go and tell him off. I'm out of patience. Do calm down and be practical. I had rather my mistress dealt with him and your father, she has some influence with Tartuffe. I've noted he hangs upon her words, seems most devoted and may indeed be smitten by her charm. Pray heaven it's true, twould do our cause no harm. She sent for him just now 
uh, to sound him out on this affair you're so incensed about. She'll find out where he stands and tell him, too, what dreadful strife and trouble will ensue if he lends countenance to your father's plan. I couldn't get in to see him, but his man says that he's almost finished with his prayers. Go now. I'll catch him when he comes downstairs. I want to hear this conference, and I will. No, they, they must be alone. Oh, I, I'll keep still. Not you. I know your temper. You'd start a brawl and shout and stamp your foot and spoil it all. Go on. I won't. I have a perfect right. Lord, you're a nuisance. He's coming. Get out of sight. Demi conceals himself. Scene two, Tartuffe and Doreen. Tartuffe observing Doreen and calling to his man off stage. Hang up my hair shirt. Put my scourge in place. And pray, Laurent, for heaven's perpetual grace. I'm going to the prison now to share my last few coins with the poor wretches there. Dear God, what affectation. What a fake. You wish to see me? Yes. Oh, for mercy's sake, please take this handkerchief before you speak. What? Cover that bosom, girl. The flesh is weak and unclean thoughts are difficult to control. Such sights as that can undermine the soul. Your soul, it seems, has very poor defenses and flesh makes quite an impact on your senses. It's strange that you're so easily excited. My own desires are not so soon ignited. And if I saw you naked as a beast, not all your hide would tempt me in the least. Girl, speak more modestly. Unless you do, I shall be forced to take my leave of you. Oh no. It's I who must be on my way. I've just one little message to convey. Madam is coming down and begs you, sir, to wait and have a word or two with her. Gladly. That had a softening effect. I think my guess about him was correct. Well, she be long. Oh no, that's her step I hear. Here she is, I shall disappear. Scene three, Elmir and Tartuffe. May heaven, whose infinite goodness we adore, preserve your body and soul forevermore, and bless your days, and answer thus the plea of one who is its humblest votary. I thank you for that pious wish, but please do take a chair and let's be more at ease. I trust that you are once more well and strong. Oh yes. The fever didn't last for long. My prayers are too unworthy, I am sure, to have gained from heaven this most gracious cure. But lately, madam, my every supplication has had for object your recuperation. You shouldn't have troubled, so I, I don't deserve it. Your health is priceless, madam, and to preserve it, I'll gladly give my own, in all sincerity. Sir, you outdo us all in Christian charity. You've been... Most kind, I count myself your debtor. It was nothing, madam. I long to serve you better. Uh, there's a, a private matter I'm anxious to discuss. I'm glad there's no one here to hinder us. I too am glad. It floods my heart with bliss to find myself alone with you like this. For just this chance I've prayed with all my power, but prayed in vain until this happy hour. This won't take long, sir, and I hope you'll be entirely frank and unconstrained with me. Indeed. There's nothing I had rather do than bear my inmost heart and soul to you. First, let me say that what remarks I've made about the constant visits you were paid were prompted not by any mean emotion, but rather by a pure and deep devotion, a fervent zeal. No need for explanation. Your sole concern, I'm sure, was my salvation. Quite so. And such great fervor do I feel. Oh, please, <laughs> you're pinching. It was from excess of zeal. I never meant to cause you pain, I swear. I'd rather... What uh, can your hand be doing there? Feeling your gown. What soft, fine woven stuff. Please, I'm extremely ticklish, that's enough. My, my, what lovely lace work on your dress. The workmanship's miraculous. No less, 
I've not seen anything to equal it. Yes, quite. But let's talk of business for a bit. They say my husband means to break his word and give his daughter to you, sir. Have you heard? He did mention it. But I confess I dream of quite a different happiness. It's elsewhere, madam, that my eyes discern the promise of that bliss for which I yearn. I see. You care for nothing here below. Ah, well, my heart's not made of stone, you know. All your desires mount heavenward, I'm sure, in scorn of all that's earthly and impure. A love of heavenly beauty does not preclude a proper love for earthly pulchritude. Our senses are quite rightly captivated by perfect works our master has created. Some glory clings to all that heaven has made. In you, all heaven's marvels are displayed. On that fair face, such beauties have been lavished. The eyes are dazzled and the heart is ravished. How could I look on you, O oh, flawless creature, and not adore the author of all nature, feeling a love both passionate and pure? For you, his triumph of self-portraiture. It is, I know, presumptuous on my part to bring you this poor offering of my heart. And it is not my merit, heaven knows, but your compassion on which my hopes repose. You are my peace my solace, my salvation. On you depends my bliss or desolation. I bide your judgment, and as you think best, I shall be either miserable or blessed. Your declaration is most gallant, sir, but don't you think it's out of character? You'd have done better to restrain your passion and think before you spoke in such a fashion. It ill becomes a pious man like you. I may be pious, but I'm human, too. With your celestial charms before my eyes, a man has not the power to be wise. I know such words sound strangely coming from me, but I'm no angel, nor was meant to be. And if you blame my passion, you must needs reproach as well the charms on which it feeds. Your loveliness I had no sooner seen than you became my soul's unrivaled queen. If, in compassion for my soul's distress, you'll stoop to comfort my unworthiness, I'll raise to you in thanks for that sweet manna, an endless hymn, an infinite hosanna. With me, of course, there need be no anxiety. No fear of scandal or of notoriety. These young court gallants, whom all the ladies fancy, are vain in speech, in action, rash and chancy. When they succeed in love, they would soon know it. No favor grants them, but they disclose it, and by the looseness of their tongues profane the very altar where their hearts have lain. Men of my sort, however, love discreetly and may one trust our reticence completely. My keen concern for my good name in yours, the absolute security of yours. In short, I offer you, my dear Elmir, love without scandal, pleasure without fear. I've heard your well-turned speeches to the end and what you urge, I clearly apprehend, Aren't you afraid that I may take a notion to tell my husband of your warm devotion and that of uh, supposing he were truly t duly told, his feelings towards you might grow rather cold? I know, dear lady, that your exceeding charity will lead your heart to pardon my temerity. That you'll excuse my violent affection as human weakness, human imperfection. Oh, that, oh, fairest. You will bear in mind that I'm but flesh and blood, and am not blind. Some women might do otherwise, perhaps. But I shall be discreet about your lapse. I'll tell my husband nothing of what occurred if, in return, you'll give your solemn word to advocate as fierce, uh, forcefully as you can that marriage of Valer and Marianne renouncing all desire to dispossess another of his rightful happiness. And so 
scene four, Elmir, Tartuffe, and Demi emerging from the closet where he's been hiding, Demi. No, no, we'll not hush up this vile affair. I heard it all inside that closet there. Oh, this great rascal prompted me to hide. <laughs> now I have my long-awaited chance to punish his deceit and arrogance. Oh, and give my father clear and shocking proof of the black character of his dear Tartuffe. No, Demise. I'll be content if he will study to deserve my leniency. I promised silence. Don't make my Amy break my word. To make a scandal would be too absurd. Good wives laugh off such trifles and forget them. Why should they tell their husbands? Upset them. You have your reasons for taking such a course, and I have reasons too of equal force. To spare him now would be insanely wrong. I've swallowed my just wrath for far too long and watched this insolent bigot bringing strife and bitterness into our family life. Too long he's meddled in my father's affairs, thwarting my marriage hopes and poor Valère's. It's high time that my father was undeceived, and now I have proof that can't be disbelieved, proof that was furnished, by, furnished me by heaven above. It's too good not to take advantage of. This is my chance, and I deserve to lose it if for one moment I hesitate to use it. Demi. No, I must do what I think is right. Madam, my heart is bursting with delight, and whatever you will, I'll not consent to lose the sweet revenge on which I'm bent. I'll settle matters without more ado, and here, most opportunely, is my cue. In five, we're going to meet Tartuffe and Melmere. Father, I'm glad you've joined us. Let us advise you of some fresh news, which doubtless will surprise you. I've just now been repaid with interest for all your loving kindness to our guest. He's proved his warm and grateful feelings towards you. It's with a pair of horns he would reward you. Yes, I surprised him with your wife and heard his whole adulterous affair, every word. She, with her alty gentle disposition, would not have told you of his proposition, but I shall not make terms with brazen lechery and feel that not to tell you would be treachery. And I hold that one's husband's peace of mind should not be so spoilt by tattle of this kind. These are my sentiments, and I wish to me that you had heeded me and held your peace. Dean Six, or go to me and Tartuffe. Can it be true, this dreadful thing I hear? Yes, brother. I'm a wicked man, I fear. A wretched sinner, all depraved and twisted. The greatest villain that ever has existed. My life's one heap of crimes which grows each minute. There's naught but foulness and corruption in it. And I perceive that heaven, outraged by me, has chosen this occasion to mortify me. Charge me with any deed you wish to name. I'll not defend myself, but take the blame. Believe what you are told and drive Tartuffe like some base criminal from beneath your roof. Yes, drive me hence, and with a parting curse, I shan't protest, for I deserve far worse. Ah, you deceitful boy. How dare you try to stain his purity with so foul a lie? What? Are you taken in by such a bluff? Did you not hear? Enough, you rogue! Enough! Ah, brother, let him speak. You're being unjust. Believe his story. The boy deserves your trust. Why, after all, should you have faith in me? How can you know what I might do or be? It is on my good actions that you base your favor? Do you trust my pious face? Ah, no, don't be deceived by hollow shows. I'm far, alas, from being what men suppose. Through the world takes me for a man of worth. I'm truly the most worthless man on earth. Yes, my dear son, speak out now. Call me the chief of sinners, a wretch, a murderer, a thief. Load me with all the names men must abhor. I'll not complain. I've earned them all and more. I'll kneel here while you pour them on my head as a just punishment for the life I've led. This is too much, dear brother. Have you no heart? Are you so hoodwinked by this rascal's art? 
Be still, you monster. Brother, I pray you rise. Villain. But... I... Silence! Can't you realize? Just one word more, and I'll tear you limb from limb. In God's name, brother, don't be harsh with him. I'd rather be f tortured at the stake than see him bear one scratch for my poor sake. Ingrate. If I must beg you on bended knee to pardon him, such goodness cannot be. Now there's true charity. What? You... Villain, I... be still! I know your motives. I know you wish him ill. Yes, all of you. Wife, children, servants, all conspire against him and desire his fall, employing every shameful trick you can to alienate me from this saintly man. Ah, but the more you seek to drive him away, the more I'll do to keep him. Without delay, I'll spite this household and confound its pride by giving him my daughter as his bride. You're going to force her to accept his hand. Yes, and this very night, do you understand? I shall defy you all and make it clear that I'm the one who gives the orders here. Come, wretch, kneel down and clasp his blessed feet and ask his pardon for your black deceit. I ask that swindler's pardon? What? I'd so, rather... You insult him and defy your father? A stick! A stick! No, no, no! Release me, do! Out of this house, this minute! Be off with you and never set foot in it again! Well, I shall go, but... Well, go quickly then! I disinherit you! An empty purse is all you'll get from me, except my curse. Teen seven, Orgon and Tartuffe. How oh, he blasphemed your good name. What a son. Forgive him, Lord, as I've already done. You can't know how it hurts when someone tries to blacken me in my dear brother's eyes. Aww. The mere thought of such ingratitude plunges my soul into so dark, a mood. Such horror grips my heart. I gasp for breath, cannot speak, feel myself near death. Argon runs in tears to the door through which he has just driven his son. You blackguard! Why did I spare you? Why did I not break you into little pieces on the spot? Compose yourself. Don't be hurt, dear friend. These scenes... These dreadful quarrels have got to end. I've much upset your household, and I perceive that the best thing will be for me to leave. What are you saying? They're all against me here. They'd have you think me false and insincere. Uh, uh, what of that? Have I ceased believing in you? Their adverse talk will certainly continue, and charges which you now repudiate you may find credible at a later date. No. Brother, never. Brother, a wife can sway her husband's mind in many a subtle way. No, no. To leave at once is the solution. Thus only I can end their persecution. No, no, I'll not allow it. You shall remain. Well, will mean much martyrdom and pain. But if you wish it, oh. enough. So be it. But one thing must be settled, as I see it. For your dear honor and for our friendship's sake, there's one precaution I feel bound to take. I shall avoid your wife and keep away. No, you shall not. Whatever they may say, it pleases me to vex them. And for spite, I'd have them see you with her day and night. What's more... I'm going to drive them to despair by making you my only son and heir. This very day, I'll give to you alone clear deed and title to everything I own. A dear, good friend and son-in-law to be is more than wife 
or child or kin to me. Will you accept my offer, dearest son? In all things, let the will of heaven be done. Poor fellow. Come, we'll go draw up the deed. Then let them burst with disappointed greed. Act 4, Scene 1, Cleant and Tartuffe. Yes, all the town's discussing it, and truly, their comments do not flatter you unduly. I'm glad we've met, sir, and I'll give my view of this sad matter in a word or two. As for who's guilty, that I shan't discuss. Let's say it was Demi who caused the fuss, assuming then that you have been ill-used by young Demi and groundlessly accused, ought not a Christian to forgive? And ought he not to stifle every vengeful thought? Alas, for my part, I should take great joy in doing so. I've nothing against the boy. I pardon all. I harbor no resentment. To serve him would afford me much contentment. But heaven's interest will not have it so. If he comes back, then I shall have to go. After his conduct, so extreme, so vicious... Our further intercourse would look suspicious. God knows what people would think. Why, they'd describe my goodness to him as a sort of bribe. Your reasoning is badly warped and stretched. And these excuses, sir, are most far-fetched. Why put yourself in charge of heaven's cause? Does heaven need our help to enforce its laws? Leave vengeance to the Lord, sir. While we live, our duty is not to punish, but forgive. Again, sir, let me say that I've forgiven dummies, and thus obeyed the laws of heaven. But I am not commanded by the Bible to live with one who smears my name with libel. Were you commanded, sir, to indulge the whim of poor Orgon and to encourage him in suddenly transferring to your name a large estate to which you have no claim? It would never occur to those who know me best to think I acted from self-interest. <sighs> the treasures of this world I quite despise. Their specious glitter does not charm my eyes. And if I have resigned myself to taking the gift which by my dear brother insists on making, I do so only as he well understands, lest so much wealth fall into wicked hands lest those to whom it might descend in time turn it to purposes of sin and crime, and not, as I shall do, make use of it for heaven's glory and mankind's benefit. Oh, forget these trumped-up fears. Your argument is one the rightful heir might well resent. It is a moral burden to inherit such wealth, but give to me a chance to bear it. Would it not be the decent thing to beat a generous and honorable retreat rather than let the son of the house be sent for your convenience into banishment. Sir, if you wish to prove the honesty of your intentions. Sir, it is half past three. I have certain pious duties to attend to and hope my prompt departure won't offend you. Exit. Ah, oh, mad. Scene two, Elmir, Marianne, Cleant, and Doreen. Stay, sir, and help Marianne, for heaven's sake. She's suffering, so I fear her heart will break. Her father's plan to marry her off tonight has put the poor child in a desperate plight. I hear him coming. Let's stand together now and see if we can't change his mind somehow about this match we all deplore and fear. In three, Orgon, Elmir, Marianne, Cleant, and Doreen. Glad to find you all assembled here. This contract, child, contains your happiness. And what it says, I think your heart can guess. Sir, by that heaven which sees me here distressed, and by whatever else can move your breast, do not employ a father's power, I pray you, to crush my heart and force it to obey you. Nor by your harsh commands oppress me so, that I'll begrudge the duty which I owe. And do not so embitter and enslave me that I shall hate the very life you gave me. My sweet hopes must perish, if you refuse to give me the one I've dared to choose, spare me at least, I, I beg you, I implore, the pain of wedding one whom I abhor. 
and do not by a heartless use of force drive me to contemplate some desperate course. Be firm, my soul. No human weakness now. I don't resent your love for him. Allow your heart free reign, sir. Give him your property, and if that's not enough, take mine from me. He's welcome to my money. Take it, do, but don't, I pray, include my person, too. Spare me, I beg you, and let me end the tale of my sad days behind a convent veil. <laughs> a convent! <laughs> when crossed in their amours, all lovesick girls have the same thought as yours. Get up! The more you loathe the man and to dread him, the more ennobling it will be to wed him. Marry Tartuffe and mortify your flesh. In enough, don't start that whimpering afresh. But why? Be still there. Speak when you're spoken to, not one more bit of impudence out of you. If, if I may offer a, a word of counsel here. Brother, in counseling, you have no peer. All your advice is forceful, sound, and clever. I don't propose to follow it, however. I am amazed and don't know what to say. Your blindness simply takes my breath away. You are indeed bewitched to take no warning from our account of what occurred this morning. Madam, I know a few plain facts, and one is that you're partial to my rascal son. Hence, when he sought to make Tartuffe the victim of a base lie, you dared not contradict him. But you underplayed your part, my pet. You should have looked more angry, more upset. When men make overtures, must we reply with righteous anger and a battle cry? Must we turn back their amorous advances with sharp reproaches and with fiery glances? Myself, I find such offenses merely amusing and make no senses and fusses in refusing. I found that a polite and cool rebuff discourages a lover quite enough. I know the facts, and I shall not be shaken. I marvel at your power to be mistaken. Would it, I wonder, carry weight with you if I could show you that our tale was true? Show me? Yes. Rot. Come, what if I found a way to make you see the facts? Plain as day. <laughs> Nonsense. Do answer me. Don't be absurd. I'm not now asking you to trust our word. Suppose that from some hiding place in here, you learned the whole sad truth by ear and ear. What would you say of your good friend after that? Why, I'd say... Nothing by Jehoshaphat. It can't be true. You've been too long deceived, and I'm quite tired of being disbelieved. Come now, let's put my statement to the test, and you shall see the truth made manifest. I'll take that challenge. Now do your uttermost. We'll see how you make good your empty boast. Send him to me. He's crafty. It may be hard to catch the cunning scoundrel off his guard. No, amorous men are gullible. Their conceit so blinds them that they're never hard to cheat. Have him come to me. Have him come down. Please leave us for a bit. In for Elmir and Orgon. Pull up this table and get under it. What? It's essential that you be well hidden. Why there? Oh, heavens. Just do as you are bidden. I have my plans. We'll soon see how they fare. Under the table now. And once you're there, take care you are neither seen nor heard. Well, I'll indulge you, since I gave my word to see you through this infantile charade. Once it is over, you'll be glad we play. I'm going to act quite strangely now, and you must not be shocked at anything I do. Whatever I may say, you must excuse as part of that deceit I'm forced to use. I shall employ sweet speeches in the task of making that imposter drop his mask. I'll give him encouragement to his bold desires and furnish fuel for his amorous fires. Since it's for your sake, 
and for his destruction that I seem, shall seem to yield to his seduction, I'll gladly stop whenever you decide that your doubts are fully satisfied. I'll count on you as soon as you have seen what sort of man he is to intervene, not expose me to his odious lust one moment longer than you feel you must. Remember, you are to save me from my plight whenever he's coming. Hush, keep out of sight. Scene five, Tartuffe, Elmir, and Orgon. You wish to have a word with me, I'm told. Yes, I've a, a little secret to unfold. Before I speak, however, it would be wise to close that door and look about for spies. The very last thing that must happen now is a repetition of this morning's row. I've never been so badly caught off guard. Oh, how I feared for you. You saw how hard I tried to make that troublesome to me control his dreadful temper and hold his peace. In my confusion, I didn't have the sense to simply contradict his evidence. But as it happens, that was for the best. And all has worked out in our interest. This storm has only bettered your position. My husband doesn't have the least suspicion, and now, in mockery of those who do, he bids me continually with you. And that is why, quite fearless of reproof, I now can be alone with my Tartuffe, and why my heart, perhaps too quick to yield, feels free to let its passion be revealed. Madam, your words confuse me. Not long ago, you spoke in quite a different style, you know. Oh, sir, if that refusal made you smart, it's little that you know of woman's heart or what that heart is trying to convey when it resists in such a feeble way. Always, at first, our modesty prevents the frank avowal of tender sentiments however high the passion which inflames us. Still, to confess its power somehow shames us. Thus, we reluct at first, yet in a tone which tells you that our heart is overthrown, that what our lips deny our pulse confesses, and that in time all no's will turn to yeses. I fear my words are all too frank and free, a poor proof of woman's modesty. And since I'm started, tell me, if you will, would I have tried to make to me be still? Would I have listened calm and unoffended until your lengthy offer of love was ended and been so very mild in my reaction had your sweet words not given me satisfaction? And when I tried to force you to undo the marriage plans my husband has in view, what did my urgent pleading signify if not that I admired you and that I deplored the thought that someone else might own part of my heart I wished for mine alone? Madam, no happiness is so complete as when from lips we love come words so sweet their nectar floods my every sense and drains in honeyed rivulets through all my veins. To please you is my joy, my only goal. Your love is the restorer of my soul. And yet, I must beg leave now to confess some lingering doubts as to my happiness. Might this not be a trick? Might not the catch be that you wish me to break off the match with Marianne and so have feigned to love me? I shan't quite trust your fond opinion of me until the feelings you've expressed so sweetly are demonstrated somewhat more concretely. And you have shown by certain kind concessions that I may put my faith in your professions. <coughs> Why be in such a hurry? Must my heart exhaust its bounty at the very start? To make that sweet admission cost me dear, but you'll not be content, it would appear, unless my store of favors is dispersed to the last farthing and at the very first. The less we merit, the less we dare to hope. 
and with our doubts, mere words can never cope. We trust no promised bliss till we receive it, not till the joy is ours can we believe it. I, who so little merit your esteem, can't credit this fulfillment of my dream, and shan't believe it, madam, until I savor some palpable assurance of your favor. My, how tyrannical your love can be, and how it flusters and perplexes me. How furiously you take one's heart in hand, and make your every wish a fierce command. Come, must you hound and harry me to death? You will not give me time to catch my breath? Can it be right to press me with such force? Give me no quarter, show me no remorse, and take advantage by your stern insistence of the fond feelings which weaken my resistance. Well, if you look with favor upon my love, why then begrudge me some clear proof thereof? But how can I consent without offense to heaven, toward which you feel such reverence? If heaven is all that holds you back, don't worry. I can remove that hindrance in a hurry. Nothing of that sort need obstruct our path. But must one not be afraid of heaven's wrath? Madam, forget such fears and be my pupil, and I shall teach you how to conquer scruple. Some joys, it's true, are wrong in heaven's eyes, yet heaven is not averse to compromise. There is a science lately formulated whereby one's conscience may be liberated, and any wrongful act you care to mention may be redeemed by purity of intention. I'll teach you, madam, the secrets of that science. Meanwhile, just place on me your full reliance. Assuage my keen desires and feel no dread. The sin, if any, shall be on my head. <coughs> You've a bad Ooh. cough. Yes, yes, it's uh, bad indeed. Uh, licorice may be what you need. No, uh, I have a stubborn cold, it seems. I'm sure it will take much more than licorice to cure it. How aggravating. Oh, more than I can say. If you're still troubled, think of things this way. No one shall know our joys save us alone. And there's no evil till the act is known. It's scandal, madam, which makes it an offense. And it's no sin to sin in confidence. <coughs> well, clearly I must do as you require. And yield to your importunate desire. It is apparent now that nothing less will satisfy you. And so I acquiesce to go so far as much against my will, but I'm vexed that it should come to this. But still, since you are so determined on it, since you will not allow mere language to convince you, and since you ask for concrete evidence, I see nothing for it now but to comply. If this is sinful, if I'm the wrong to do it, so much the worse for him who drove me to it. The fault can surely not be charged to me. Madam, the fault is mine, if fault there be. And... Open the door a little uh, and peek out. I wouldn't want my husband poking about. Why worry about the man? Each day he grows more gullible. One can lead him by the nose. To find us here would fill him with delight. And if he saw the worst, he doubt his own sight. Nevertheless, do step out for a minute into the hall and see that no one's in it. Scene six, Orgon Elmir. Orgon comes <laughs> out from under the table. Man's a perfect monster. I must admit, I'm simply stunned. I can't get over it. What? Coming out so soon? How premature. Get back in hiding and wait until you're sure. Stay till the end and be convinced completely we mustn't stop till things are proved concretely. Hell never harbored anything so vicious. Pat, don't be hasty. Try to be judicious. Wait and be certain that there's no mistake. No jumping to conclusions, for heaven's sake. <laughs> she places Orgon behind her as Tartuffe re-enters. Scene seven, Tartuffe, Elmir, and Orgon. Madam, all things have worked out to perfection. At giving the neighboring rooms a full inspection, no one's about. And now I may at last... Hold on! My passionate fellow, not so fast. 
I should advise a little more restraint. Well, so you thought you'd fool me, my dear saint. How soon you wearied of the saintly life, wedded my daughter and coveting my wife. I've long suspected you and had a feeling that soon I'd catch you at your double dealing. Just now you've given me evidence galore. It's quite enough. I have no wish for more. I'm sorry to have treated you so slyly, but circumstances forced me to be wily. <laughs> Brother, you can't think. No more talk from you. Just leave this household without more ado. What I intended... That seems fairly clear. Spare me your falsehoods and get out of here. No. I'm the master, and you're the one to go. This house belongs to me, I'll have you know, and I shall show you that you can't hurt me by this contemptible conspiracy that those who cross me know not what they do and that I have means to expose and punish you. Avenge offended heaven and make you grieve that ever you dared order me to leave. In eight, Amir and Orgon. What? was the point of all that angry chatter? Dear God, I'm worried. This is no laughing matter. How so? I, I fear I understood his drift. I'm much disturbed about that deed of gift. You gave him- Yes, it's all been drawn and signed, but one thing more is weighing on my mind. What's that? I'll tell you. But first, let's see if there's a certain strong box in his room upstairs. Act five, scene one, Orgon Cleant. Where are you going so fast? God knows. Then wait. Let's have conference and deliberate on how this situation's to be met. That strong box has me utterly upset. This is the worst of many, many shocks. Is there some fearful mystery in that box? My poor friend Argus brought that box to me with his own hands in utmost secrecy. It was on the very morning of his flight. It's, it's full of papers which, if they came to light, would ruin him, or such is my impression. Then why did you let it out of your possession? Those papers vexed my conscience, and it seemed best to ask the counsel of my pious guest. Oh. The cunning scoundrel got me to agree to leave the strong box in his custody, so that in case of an investigation, I could employ a slight equivocation and swear I didn't have it, and thereby, at no expense to conscience, tell a lie. It looks to me as if you're out on a limb, trusting him with that box and offering him that deed of gift or actions of a kind which scarcely indicate a prudent mind. With two such weapons, he has the upper hand. And since you're vulnerable, as matters stand, you've erred once more in bringing him to bay. You should have acted in some subtler way. Just think of it. Behind that fervent face, a heart so wicked and a soul so base. I took him in, a hungry beggar, and then... Enough! By God, I'm through with pious men! Henceforth, I'll hate the whole false brotherhood and persecute them worse than Satan could. Ah, there you go, extravagant as ever. Why can you not be rational? You never manage to take the middle course, it seems, but jump instead between absurd extremes. You've recognized your recent grave mistake in falling victim to a pious fake. Now, to correct that error, must you embrace an even greater error in its place? and judge our worthy neighbors as a whole by what you've learned of one corrupted soul? Be cautious in bestowing admiration and cultivate a sober moderation. Don't humor fraud, but also don't asperse true piety. The latter fault is worse, and it is best to err, if err one must, as you have done, upon the side of trust. Scene two, Demi, Orgon, and Cleant. Father. I hear that scoundrels uttered threats against you, that he pridefully forgets. It's true, my boy. I'm too distressed for tears. Leave it to me, sir. 
Let me trim his ears. Face with such insolence, we must not waver. I shall rejoice in doing you the favor of cutting short his life and your distress. What a display of young hot-headedness. Do learn to moderate your fits of rage. In this just country, this enlightened age, one does not settle things by violence. Scene three, Madame Purnell, Marianne, Elmire, Doreen, Demi, Organt, and Cleon. I hear strange tales of very strange events. Yes, strange events which these two eyes beheld. The man's ingratitude is unparalleled. I save a wretched pauper from starvation, house him and treat him like a blood relation, shower him every day with my largesse, Give him my daughter and all that I possess. And meanwhile, the unconscionable knave tries to induce my wife to <clears throat> misbehave. And not content with such extreme rascality, now threatens me with my own liberality and aims by taking base advantage of the gifts I gave him out of Christian love to drive me from my house, a ruined man, and make me end a pauper as he began. Poor fellow. No, my son, I'll never bring myself to think him guilty of such a thing. How's that? The righteous always were maligned. Speak clearly, mother. Say what's on your mind. I mean that I can smell a rat, my dear. You know how everybody hates him here. That has no bearing on the case at all. I told you a hundred times when you were small that virtue in this world is hated ever. Malicious men may die, but malice never. No doubt that's true, but how does it apply? They've turned you against him by a clever lie. I've told you I was there and saw it done. Ah, uh, slanderers will stop at nothing, son. Mother, I'll lose my temper. For the last time, I tell you I was witness to the crime. The tongues of spirits are busy right and night and noon, and to their venom, no man is immune. You're talking nonsense. Can't you realize I saw it? Saw it! Saw it with my eyes! Saw! Do you understand me? Must I shout it into your ears before you'll cease to doubt me? Appearances can deceive, my son. Hear me. We cannot always judge by what we see. Drat! Drat! One often interprets things awry. Good can seem evil to a suspicious eye. Was I to see his pawing at Elmir as an act of charity? Till his guilt is clear, a man deserves the benefit of the doubt. You should have waited to see how things turned out. Great God in heaven, what more proof did I need? Was I to sit there watching until he... You drive me to the brink of impropriety. No, no. A man of such surpassing piety could not do such a thing. You cannot shake me. I don't believe it, and you shall not make me. You vex me so that if, if you weren't my mother, I'd say to you, ooh, some dreadful thing or other. It's your turn now, sir, not to be listened to. You'd not trust us, and now she won't trust you. My friends, we're wasting time which should be spent in facing up to our predicament. I fear that scoundrel's threat weren't made in sport. You think he has the nerve to go to court? I'm sure he won't. They'd find it all too crude, a case of swindling and ingratitude. Don't be too sure. He won't be at a loss to give his claims a high and righteous gloss. And clever rogues with far less valid cause have trapped their victims in a web of laws. I say again that to antagonize a man so strongly armed was most unwise. No, but the man's appalling cheek outraged me so I couldn't control my peak. I wish to heaven that we could devise some truce between you or some compromise. Well, if I had known what cards he held, I'd not have roused his anger by my little plot. What is that fellow looking for? Who is he? Uh, go talk to him and tell him I 
am busy. In four, Monsieur Loyal, Madame Pernell, Marianne, Almir, Doreen, Damise, Organ, and Cléant. Good day, dear sister. Kindly let me see your master. He's involved with company and cannot be disturbed just now, I fear. I hate to intrude, but what has brought me here will not disturb your master in any event. Indeed, my news will make him most content. Your name? Just say that I bring greetings from Monsieur Tartuffe, on whose behalf I've come. Sir, he's a very gracious man and bears a message from Tartuffe, which he declares will make you most content. On my word, I think this man had best be seen and heard. Perhaps he has some settlement to suggest. How shall I treat him? What manner would be best? Control your anger. And if he, if he should mention some fair adjustment, give him your full attention. Good health to you, good sir. May heaven confound your enemies and may your joys abound. A gentle salutation. It confirms my guess that he is here to offer terms. I've always held your family most dear. I served your father, sir, for many a year. Sir, I must ask your pardon. To my shame, I cannot now recall your face or name. Loyal's my name. I come from Chicopee, and I'm a bailiff in all modesty. For 40 years, praise God, it's been my boast to serve with honor in that vital post. And I am here, sir, if you will permit the liberty to serve you with this writ. To what? Now, please, sir, let us have no friction. It's nothing but a notice, but an order of eviction. You are to move your goods and family out and make way for new occupants without deferment or delay and give the keys. I leave this house. My yes, sir, if you please. This house, sir, from the cellar to the roof, belongs now to our good friend Tartuffe, and he is lord and master of your estate by virtue of a deed of present date drawn in due form with clearest legal phrasing. Your insolence is utterly amazing. Young man, my business here is not with you, but with your wise and temperate father, who, like every worthy citizen, stands in awe of justice and would never obstruct the law. But... Not for a million, sir, would you rebel against authority. I know that well. You'll not make trouble, sir, or interfere with the execution of my duties here. Someone may execute a smart tattoo on that black jacket of yours before you're through. Sir, bid your son be silent. I'd much regret having to mention such a nasty threat of violence in writing my report. This man loyal's the most disloyal sort. <laughs> I love all men of upright character, and when I agreed to serve these papers, sir, it was your feelings that I had in mind. I couldn't bear to see the case assigned to someone else who might esteem you less and so subject you to unpleasantness. What's more unpleasant than telling a man to leave his house and home? You'd like a short reprieve? If you desire it, sir, I shall not press you, but wait until tomorrow to dispossess you. Splendid. I'll come and spend the night here then, most quietly with uh, half a score of men. For form's sake, you might bring me just before you go to bed the keys to the front door. My men, I promise, will be on their best behavior and will not disturb your rest. But bright and early, sir, you must be quick and move out all your furniture, every stick. I may be all but bankrupt, but I vow I'd give a hundred bucks here and now just for the pleasure of landing one good clout right on the end of that complacent snout. Careful, don't make things worse. My boot sole itches to give that beggar a good kick in the britches. Monsieur Loyal, I'd love to hear the whack of a stout stick across your fine broad back. Take care. A woman, too, may go to jail if she use threatening language to a bailiff. Enough! Enough, sir. This must not go on. Give me that paper, please, and then be gone. Well, au revoir. God give you all good cheer. 
May God confound you and him who sent you here! In five, Orgon, Cleant, Marianne, Elmire, Madame Pernel, Doreen, and Dami. Now, mother, was I right or not? This writ should change your notion of Tartuffe a bit. Do you perceive his villainy at last? I'm thunderstruck. I'm utterly aghast. Oh, come, be fair. You mustn't take offense at this new proof of his benevolence. He's acting out of selfless love. I know material things enslave the soul, and so he kindly has arranged your liberation from all that might endanger your salvation. Will you not ever hold your tongue, you dunce? Come, you must take some action, and at once. Go tell the world of the low trick he's tried. The deed of gift is surely nullified by such behavior, and public rage will not permit the wretch to carry out his plot. In six, Valère, Orgon, Cléant, Marianne, Elmire, Madame Pernel, Doreen, and Demi. Sir, though I hate to bring you more bad news, such is the danger that I cannot choose. A friend who is extremely close to me and knows my interest in your family has, for my same sake, presumed to violate that secrecy that's due to things of state and sends me word that you are in a plight from which your one salvation lies in flight. That scoundrel who's imposed upon you so denounced you to the court an hour ago and as supporting evidence displayed the strong box of a certain renegade whose secret papers so he testified you had disloyally agreed to hide. I don't know just what charges may be pressed but there's a warrant out for your arrest. Tartuffe has been instructed, furthermore, to guide the arresting officer to your door. He's cl clearly done this to facilitate his seizure of your house and your estate. My carriage is outside to take you hence. This money should cover all expense. Let's lose no time or you shall be undone. The sole defense is, in this case is to run. I shall go with you all the way and place you in a safe refuge to which they'll never trace you. Alas, dear boy, I wish that I could show you my gratitude for everything I owe you. But now is not the time. I, I pray the Lord that I may live to give you your reward. Farewell, my dears. Be careful. Brother, hurry. We shall take care of things. You needn't worry. In seven, the officer Tartuffe Valère or Gonclayant, Marianne, Elmire, Madame Parnell, Doreen, and Demi. Gently, sir. Gently. Stay right where you are. No need for haste. Your lodging isn't far. You're off to prison by order of the judge. This is the crowning blow. And since you sludge, it means my total ruin and defeat. Your villainy is at last complete. You didn't try to provoke me. It's no use. Those who serve heaven must expect abuse. You are indeed most patient, sweet, and blameless. How he exploits the name of heaven, it's shameless. Your taunts and mockeries are all for naught. To do my duty is my only thought. Your love of duty is most meritorious, and what you've done is little short of glorious. All deeds are glorious, madam, which obey his honor who sent me here today. I rescued you when you were destitute. Have you forgotten that, you thankless brute? No, no, I well remember every tort. But my first duty is to serve the court. That obligation is so paramount that other claims beside it do not count. And for it, I would sacrifice my wife, my family, my friend, or my life. All that we most revere, he uses to cloak his plots and camouflage his ruses. If it is true that you are animated by pure and loyal zeal, as you stated, why was this zeal not roused until you'd sought to make Orgon a cuckold and been caught? Why weren't you moved to give your evidence until your outraged host had driven you hence? I shan't say that the gift of all his treasure ought to have damped your zeal in any measure, but if he is a traitor, as you declare... How could you condescend to be his heir? Sir, spare me all this clamor. It's growing shrill. Please carry out your orders, if you will. Yes, I've delayed too long, sir. Thank you kindly. You're just the proper person to remind me. Come, 
You are off to join the other boarders in a dank prison, according to his orders. Who? I, sir? Yes. To prison? That can't be true. I owe an explanation, but not to you. Sir, all is well. Rest easy and be grateful. We serve a leader to whom all sham is hateful, a leader who sees into our inmost hearts and can't be fooled by any trickster's arts. His deep soul, though generous and human, views all things with discernment and acumen. His sovereign reason is not lightly swayed, and all his judgments are discreetly weighed. Betraying you, the rogue stood self-betrayed. Our officers soon recognized Tartuffe as one notorious by another name, who'd done so many vicious crimes that one could fill ten volumes with them, and be writing still. But, to be brief, the judge was appalled by this man's treachery toward you, which he called the last, the worst villainy of a vile career, and bade me follow the impostor here to see how gross his impudence could be, and force him to restore your property. Your private papers, by the court's command, I hereby seize and give into your hand. The court both revokes and invalidates the deed which gave this rascal your estates, and pardons, furthermore, your grave offense in harboring an exile's documents. By these decrees, the court rewards you for your courageous deeds in the late war, and shows how heartfelt is his satisfaction in recompensing any worthy action, how much he prizes merit, and how he makes more of men's virtues than of their mistakes. Heaven be praised. I breathe again. You're safe. At last. I can't believe the danger's past. Well, traitor. Now you see. Ah, oh, brother, please. Let's not descend to such indignities. Leave the poor wretch to his unhappy fate and don't say anything to aggravate his present woes, but rather hope that he will soon embrace an honest piety. Well said. Let's go at once and, gladly kneeling, express the gratitude which all are feeling. Then, when that first great duty has been done, will turn with pleasure to a second one, and give Valer, whose love has proven so true, the wedded happiness which is his due. Comedy ends with a dance. <laughs> Everybody dance now.